This is a message by Apostle Joshua Selman. This is very important. Most people don't know why they come to church. Others come to church to see a man of God. Others come to church waiting impatiently for the service to be over so that they can have moments of counseling. In their minds, they think that the counseling sessions are greater than the word sessions. Others are just there for the ceremony, just to ease the guilt of not sitting back at home when they should be in church. Are we together? Every time you come to the house of God, it's important for you to know that God has prepared for you a feast of fat things. Among them, the capacity to access light, light that leads to growth, light that translates to victory. Let me tell you the truth. There is nothing the devil can do about a believer who finds the path to victory. The domain of Satan ends when ignorance, when darkness ends in your life. For as long as you are in darkness, Satan has dominion over you. So the way to really break the dominion power of Satan is not just to assume you are free. Assumed liberty is not liberty. A prisoner can assume he's out of the prison. He's still in the prison. Are we together? But you can have true liberty. He says, and ye shall know the truth, not ye shall want the truth, not you shall assume you have found the truth. When you know the truth, the truth has within it, programmed within it, the power to make you free. The truth makes freedom. So every time you find a man enjoying liberty in any area at all, in any area, just know that his liberty is a testament that he has found truth. Sustainable liberty is proof that you have found the truth, you have received the truth, listen, you have engaged the truth, and you are now reaping the dividends of that spiritual investment. Because like God, everybody is a farmer. You have learned this. And the Bible says that you can sow to a soil called the spirit, you can sow to a soil called the flesh. That they that sow to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, death in all its ramification by any definition. And those who sow to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So what you do with your seeds, that becomes your concern. I've told you that your destiny is at the mercy of the kind and the quality of decisions that you make. Ultimately, it is up to you, the decisions that you make. The assignment of a man of God and the assignment of the teaching ministry is to guide you with sufficient knowledge, spiritual knowledge first, and then knowledge of the laws of life. So that now being equipped with sufficient knowledge, you can make quality decisions hear me again you can make quality decisions no matter how anointed a man is he cannot decide your destiny for you he will equip you with the truth but eventually you are the one who is going to have to make that decision whether to remain a failure whether to remain a success that leads me to a thought that i just wanted to point out before we go to the word tonight i was contemplating and I found something that I wrote, I don't know when now, some time back, during my, you know, personal meditation. Sometimes when I'm meditating on the word, I just pause a bit and just recline and think how true the things I'm studying or the things that I'm learning. And sometimes I'm tempted to just scrabble a few things. And here's what I wrote. I said here that you cannot improve in life and destiny until you become brutally honest with yourself. You cannot improve in life and in destiny until you become brutally honest with yourself. The greatest form of deception is self-deception. The greatest form of deception. That means you get to a point where you are lying to yourself is self-deception. You can never improve in life and destiny Except and unless and until you become brutally honest with yourself. The meaning of that is that the day you really sit down to address matters in your life, is this working? Not assumed results. For as long as you still carry imaginary progress, you know, there are people who live in an illusion. I didn't know when I started ministry. Honestly, I used to hear that people 
literally live in a world of illusions and it didn't make sense to me but now haven't served got a bit in leadership and ministry i can tell you there are people who live in a world that is very real to them but it doesn't exist the medical persons will call it delusion they literally are in a world that does not exist it's like a psychology version of taking drugs so they live in a world where many things happen in that world but none of it is real and they know it's not real they live like that they are making progress in their imagination they are building houses in their imagination they are growing and making tremendous progress and once in a while their reality reminds them that they are still joking are we together you cannot improve until you become brutally honest is my spiritual life working is my finances working if yes why if no why not you see whether you are making progress or not your confidence is not in the result your confidence is knowing the pathway that leads to that result it is a very terrible thing to stumble into accidental success there is such a thing as accidental success it is usually not sustainable it carries a semblance of progress for a while until you find out you did not lay hold on the principles that makes for sustenance the second thing i wrote here part of my contemplations then we get to the word seek competence before visibility seek competence before visibility seeking visibility without competence will leave you having the destiny of the fig tree that Jesus caused. You must seek competence before visibility. Our world is full of people who are incompetent in very disturbing ways and yet they have an obsession for visibility. When you sell nonsense to your world, this world you see has an, an, an they have such an unforgiving heart towards incompetence. When you show up and they give you a chance and mark you for incompetence, it will take the grace of God to erode that memory from them. Anytime they see you, they assume this unserious person is here again. And let me tell you the truth, and, and I mean this no disrespect. In the minds of people, they have arranged preachers according to different categories. Very serious, serious, are we together? Less as fair, jokers, and maybe evil doers. So by the time they see people, there are some that their presence is just entertainment. There are others that, well, they are not really sure. It depends on the sermon. There are others who they know. These people are always serious. If they show up, they are showing up to bless. I'm praying for you. May you not join a nonsense category in people's mind because of incompetence. That every time people see you show up, whether in ministry or any ramification, they know that you are there to bless. Are we together now? Praise the name of the Lord. Seek competence before visibility. In fact, quite honestly, when you spend time to seek competence, you may not need to seek visibility. It will naturally gravitate you because not everybody is that serious. Not everybody is that determined. Not everybody is that meticulous. Are we together? That resilient over becoming excellent and competent. I learned this early in life from Dr. Miles Monroe. His definition of leadership changed my paradigm. That leadership is not about leading people. In fact, in many regards, it's not even about leading yourself. Leadership is about discovering your gift refining it then deploying it to serve so selflessly that people give you a gift called loyalty so you are focused on deploying your gift discovering it deploying it now that it's refined and serving people sincerely serving so selflessly that you will not even know when they have corporately accorded you this gift called loyalty you are influential to the degree to which you have earned take note of that word and the loyalty of people are we together now you earn the loyalty of people through your depth of selflessness 
the level of value that you pour yourself like a drink offering. When you become a nuisance to people, you will never, never, never command loyalty. They will not allow you to influence them because they know you are a taker. They know you are a parasite. They see you as a nuisance, a disturbance to their becoming. I'm praying for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, everything that makes people perceive you as a nuisance, as a disturbance, I'm praying that light will upgrade you. Light will upgrade you to a point where you will say, I am a blessing indeed. You believe that? Shout amen. amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let me give you the last thought. I wrote here, know the real gift God has given you. Find out what really stands you out and stay there. Know the real gift God has given you, not the gift you want, the one God gave you. There are many things we admire that God did not give us. It is not part of your equipping. You have seen it beautifully displayed in the life of someone and you wish you had it. There's no point wishing. When you check inwards, there is always something God has given you. When you see another person's garden well, well, uh, um, uh, what they call it now, well watered, well, well, um, manicured and fixed well it is not by default so when you see your bushy scattered garden you, it is your responsibility to fix it to make it enviable are we together many people are about admiring the gifts of people every gift in his raw state is not desirable every gift i don't care what it is in its raw unrefined state is not desirable if you ever see any gift in ministry, in business, ability to sing, ability to do whatever it is, let me tell you, it is because time, energy, effort, and grace has been invested in that gift to build it to a point where it is now desirable and worthy of being rewarded. Hallelujah. There are many people you admire today. In all honesty, you are by far more gifted than them. The only thing is that you have not taken time to look inwards, to acknowledge. I like Philemon 1 verse 6. It says that the communication of your faith might become effectual through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. The communication of your faith, he says, that it would become effectual by the acknowledging. You have to acknowledge every good thing. What did God put in you? God gave me beauty. Lord, I thank you for this gift. I acknowledge not everybody has this gift to this degree. And I don't take it for granted. You have given me profound intelligence, acumen for memory, for, you know, intellectual things. I receive that grace. I acknowledge it. You have given me acumen for leadership. The Bible says he gave unto one five talent. He gave to one two talent. Matthew 25, he gave to one one talent. At least to everyone, he gave something. Are we together? So make sure you find out what God has placed within you. Everything you celebrate today came as a result of discovery, refining, and deploying. You discover, then you refine, then you deploy, and you patiently stay there until people vet your value and see it needed. Let me tell you this. I have taught you that you are only rewarded to the degree to which people acknowledge your value as being useful to their lives. And sometimes it will take a while for them to see how useful you are. Did you hear what I said? It will take a while. Just because you know how valuable you are does not mean the people around you know how valuable you are. It will have to take a while. Sometimes you will need to keep selling that value patiently. Sometimes it is time and chance that will revolve life to a point where they will need you. There are people today carrying things. They have become millionaires and billionaires. They have become great people, inspirations to many. Do you know, even when people did not acknowledge them, they still had that value. It's just that life had not yet happened to make their value needed. So just because you attempted serving your value and it seemed to be ignored, it doesn't mean your value is useless. Yours is to keep refining it and stay. Stay. Until the day that God brings the people. You see that? Brings the people around your life. And when they see you, they will take you like a treasure and say, we have been looking for you. 
we have been searching for you. Now that we have found you, we will not let you go. Are we together now? He said, because of the ointment, so do the virgins love thee. There is an ointment, there is grace, there is value you can carry. And people you do not know, like the queen of Sheba, they will run after you and hide their pride and say, now that I have found you, it took years to search for you. And now that we have found you, we will inconvenience ourselves. We will make do with whatever is still not yet working in your life and we will stay because we have found that God is with you. I'm praying for you in this season, in the name of Jesus. I've prayed this prayer many times. Let me try tonight for someone who did not receive it the last time. All those who need what you carry, all those who can celebrate what you carry, all those who can reward what you carry, may my God gravitate them to your life. All those who need what you carry, all those who can celebrate what you carry, and all those who can reward what you carry, I'm saying it again, may my God gravitate them to your life. In the name of Jesus Christ. When you find those who need what you carry, you will be a happy person, I tell you. Your first joy is serving something that is needed, serving grace, information, truth, ability that is needed and useful, and then the satisfaction that comes from making an impact in the lives of people. I have taught you here, referred to my teaching, um, What Seekest Thou? I taught you that fulfillment, there is a psychology to success and fulfillment. And that true fulfillment is predicated upon meeting certain intrinsic human needs. Number one, significance. This is not my teaching, oh. It's still part of my contemplation. We're getting to my teaching now. Are we together? Significance. That is the first human need. Everybody craves for significance. Number two, variety. People crave for variety. That's why when another iPhone comes, you suddenly hate what you loved the day before because there is a passion in people for more. Unfortunately, the side effect of having an appetite for variety, if untamed, leads to covetousness. Are we together? You will always want more, always want more till it kills you. You must get it to a time in your life where you can say enough. Praise the name of the Lord. Number three, the third psychological need of all men is growth. People want to grow, they want to grow. When a woman gets pregnant, after six months, she's happy. Are we together now? What is the difference between the protruding stomach that is as a result of cancer and the protruding stomach that is as a result of pregnancy? All of them lead to your stomach protruding. But on one hand, the woman is dancing. On another hand, she's saying, Lord, this thing must go back. The difference is an awareness that there is growth happening within her. Are we together now? The growth that is as a result of a cancerous cell is dangerous, is deadly, but the growth that is as a result of a baby within the mother's womb is a great blessing. Growth. Number four, what do people crave for? Desperately, significance. This is particularly true with men. All people but the male gender, significance. When you hear a man say, do you know who I am? That's what he's trying to say. Doesn't matter who he is. He may not even know who he is himself. If you ask him, okay, who are you? <laughs> are we together now? I am the son of so, 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 and so. Or I'm a director or this and that. That house is my own. Do you know who I is? Just craving for significance. Hallelujah. Significance. It's very powerful. So when you acknowledge people, we have a chairman of so, 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 and so in this place. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, and all those MC, they know how to massage the ego. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please, let's give it up for X, Y. You see the person trying to manage. <laughs> Hallelujah. May your world celebrate you. Yeah. Those who don't like you, they will keep crying every day. Yeah. But as for your destiny, you will keep going forward. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Growth, then significance. What else do we crave for? Impact. 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 All men desire a life that is impactful. Sit down with an armed robber, sit down with a drug addict, sit down with someone who is given to alcoholism and tell him, why is your life like this? 
if he's not under that influence, he will talk to you sincerely. He will say, even me, it's not like I really like this thing. So as stubborn as they are, something within them is crying to make meaning with their life. That's why you can give them a job now and say, okay, I will give you 100 naira, fix these blocks. And they will do it because something within them wants their lives to count. It is a terrible thing for an individual to live your life and it's not counting. It's not making any difference whatsoever. Are we together now? Very, very important. When these factors are work in your life, you will be a very fulfilled person. I taught you in the series, What Seekest Thou, that the only gift you can give yourself is fulfillment. Success is not your gift. Success comes by you serving others. But the only thing you can give yourself is called fulfillment. It is the satisfaction that comes from knowing that you have lived or are living your life effectively serving the purposes of the kingdom and being a blessing to humanity. We call it fulfillment. It's an art. There is a, an art to fulfillment. And there are many successful people I've seen in my life who are not fulfilled. It's why people can commit suicide with billions in their accounts. They are successful, but they are not fulfilled. Hallelujah. Are you ready for tonight now? Father, I'm ready to receive. Go ahead and pray in one minute and then we'll go to the teaching tonight. Every moment in your presence is for my growth. Every moment in your presence is for my lifting, for my transformation. Now your word is about to come yet again. I open up my spirit. Wisdom is about to come. My destiny is about to change. You will never be the same You've touched His grace Your life was changed You will never be the same You've touched His grace Your life must change You will never be the same You've touched His grace Your life must change You will never be the same you've touched his grace Tonight's teaching, sit down please, God bless you. Tonight's teaching is a very thought-provoking re-examination of the principles, the practices, and the pathways that you have chosen to adopt as far as your passion towards destiny actualization is concerned. And I want you to join me. We want to do a probe into the principles and the practices that you have chosen to ignore or chosen to adopt as far as becoming in every ramification is concerned. The intent of this teaching tonight is to challenge you so that if in the course of this discussion you find out that you have been following a path that is inconsistent with your desire, that you obtain grace immediately to make a U-turn. Many of you are going to be learning from tonight's teaching that you are speeding off the opposite direction to victory. Are we together now? That whilst victory is this way, you are already gallantly and some arrogantly on their way against the direction of victory. 
the Spirit of God has brought this teaching tonight to help you, to remind you and for others to caution you, to help you make a U-turn so that in partnership with the Holy Spirit, you begin to make a triumphant journey into a destiny of grace and a destiny of glory. I'm teaching tonight on a topic that I titled The Roadmap. The Roadmap. I want to show you the path to ever-increasing glory. The Roadmap. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The road map. Three scriptures very quickly. Matthew chapter 7, where we got our text for tonight from verse 13 and 11. Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 11. The road map. Jesus is speaking and he said, Enter ye into the straight gate. He said, For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. He's speaking now, Jesus. And many there be which go in there. Can you imagine? Wide is the way, the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. He says many, for whatever reason, are following that path. Verse 14. He says because straight or narrow is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Many years ago, I used to think he was talking about heaven and hell. But I got to find out that the way to the kingdom is not narrow. The way to the kingdom is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. Are we together now? Yes. This was talking about a reality that is multidimensional. And we want to pick out one of such dimensions as a compass that will help us. Job chapter 28, I believe from verse 7 and 8, Job was speaking by the Spirit and he said, There is a path which no fowl knoweth. That means even though they have an advantage of altitude, the path should not be a miracle or a wonder for the fowl like the eagle because by reason of the advantage of altitude, they are able to see even paths that humans cannot see. And yet Job is saying there is a path which in spite of the altitude, that advantage that the fowl, the bird of the air has, and the vulture's eye that they are not able to see it. Verse 8. It says the lion's whelps have not trodden there. You know they call the lion the king of the jungle and I've watched a number of documentaries on lions. They are very bold. They do not fear, especially when they are moving as a pride. They move with gallancy as though they own the forest. And sad is any creature that stands their way, especially if it's alone. They would tear it into pieces. Worst off is the hyena. Let it be that any hyena meanders the path of a pride. For no reason they will kill it. They've been arch enemies from time immemorial. Are we together now? And yet he's saying as bold, as courageous, as audacious as the lion is, there are certain parts that with its intelligence, intuition, and courage, it's not been able to get there. Even the fierce lion has not passed by it. These are parts in the spirit that only the Holy Ghost can take a man through. Remember, the eagle and the lion are two creatures that Jesus, God himself, likens himself. He uses the similitude of those creatures. The lion of the tribe of Judah and then the eagle. And yet the Bible says in as much as he's used those, those uh, similitudes, it is amazing that there are certain dimensions that they have not crossed. I'm praying for you already. In the name of Jesus Christ. These parts that only few have found in destiny and with it they have commanded enviable results. It is your turn to finally see it. In the name of Jesus Christ. A very popular scripture here, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 15. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 15. The wisdom of the preacher. He says, the labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go into the city. There is a way to go into the city. The city can mean anything. The way of destiny, the way of glory, the way of grace. How to come out of a life of shame, misery and reproach into a life of color and beauty. A life of glory by any definition. And he's saying that there is a labor of the fool. He is hardworking but not according to pattern. 
and he says it will weary every one of them because he knoweth not how to go into the city a popular scripture here jeremiah 6 16 the bible says to stand in the way and to see and to ask for the old path wherein is the good way and that when you have found it he says to walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls to ask to see to find and to walk therein and that you will find rest for your soul i wrote here and i want you to pay attention that there is a path that leads to glory and grace both in the spirit and in destiny there is a path we're dealing with the roadmap there is a path that leads to glory and grace both in the spirit and then in destiny there is also a path that leads to failure and defeat isn't it amazing that you don't just fail you are not just defeated you actually have to follow a pathway a road map that leads to an effect called defeat so there is a pathway that leads to grace and glory there is another pathway that leads to failure and defeat and this is something that everyone must come to terms with when people fail in their life whether in spiritual things or in destiny actualization most times they settle in on blaming satan they settle in on blaming the families that they may have come from and those those factors may be there but very few will actually agree that they followed a path subconsciously or unknowingly that led to an outcome called failure there are very few people who are responsible enough to admit that the reason why I failed and I keep failing is because I have followed a path diligently. Are we together? That means failure itself does not just happen. You have to be obedient to something to fail. You must be obedient to a certain pathway. You must be obedient to certain things to produce failure. Failure does not just happen. When you fail in ministry, when you fail in life, when you fail spiritually, when you fail in your finances, it looks like it was just designed for you and you became a victim. But I'm telling you, it's not true. Failure is programmed. Something plus something plus something or something minus something minus something equals the outcome called failure. So there is a path that leads to glory and grace. There is a path that leads to failure and defeat now i want to present a few submissions to you and i want you to please pay attention number one is that success victory and greatness is our heritage in christ success victory and greatness is our heritage in christ if you believe that while writing shout amen, amen. let me hear now that amen again success victory and greatness is our heritage in christ save johnny if you do not believe what i just said are we together that success victory and greatness is our heritage in christ among the many benefits of redemption is an opportunity while serving the purposes of god and living for jesus to taste of true success to taste of victorious living and to be able to attain a position of commendable greatness genesis chapter 12 please we'll read verse 2 and 3 the blessing that was proposed to abraham and i will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3. It says, I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that cursed thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God proposed a blessing. He proposed a program for Abraham. That I desire to bless the entire earth. And you have found favor with me. To be the one through whom that blessing will find expression. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. Paul was teaching us that if we be Christ. He says then are ye Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. That when God was making that promise. Cutting that covenant with Abraham. It was not just for his sake. And his seed there was not Isaac. By natural descent, he became a beneficiary of that covenant, that promise. But spiritually speaking, he was speaking about Jesus. And that now in Christ and through Christ, 
every believer, are we together, has been made a partaker of this privilege, this promise, this covenant. God did not enter the covenant with us, but we are beneficiaries of that covenant by reason of being in Christ and through Abraham. Are we together now? This is very important. If ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Psalm 71 and verse 21. A scripture that is very personal to me. It came from the mouth of the Lord to my destiny. And it's a scripture that I continually remind God of. And a scripture that has been ever before me. Join me in receiving it tonight. It says, thou shall increase my greatness and comfort me on, any, on every side. Say amen. amen. It is a dangerous thing for your greatness to increase and you do not find comfort on every side. Because I hope you know that with greatness, what surrounds you are enemies. And if God does not give you rest round about, your greatness will become a cost to your life. So it says, thou shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Reminding you again that success, victory, and greatness is your heritage in Christ. Now, let me pause for a moment and discuss this. Um, when we discuss matters of consecration, matters of surrender, matters of holiness and devotion unto the Lord, the intent is to bring us to a point where we prioritize Jesus Christ. Are we together? Above the things that this world can offer above jobs above whatever it is and it's a very accurate theology to teach believers to ascend in their passion and their drive for God beyond material things if the scope of your seeking God is the end point of your seeking God is just to acquire things then you have been misled are we together? You will get things, you will get all kinds of blessings. But that for any serious believer who is mentored properly, there are weightier and higher and more serious indices that measure success in the spirit. The greatest of them being your passion, your press, your drive for God. The depth and the extent of your devotion towards God and spiritual things. Here's why I brought this, is, this issue. Sometimes in a bid to help people stay consecrated in a bid to help people stay in the reality and the consciousness of holiness and total devotion to God especially for we preachers we make the mistake of trivializing the fact that the human spirit was designed to find fulfillment ultimately through your relationship with Christ but that there must be consolations to your Christian experience if life must make sense to you are we together now so sometimes in a bid to help people to not love the things of this world, to not love material things, we produce a lazy and an irresponsible people. People who love Jesus but having failed families. People who love Jesus but not accenting the kind of influence that gives the church a voice in society. The side effect is that we present a lopsided view of God. It is the reason why unbelievers today have the credence to mock the church. And they make it look like all we do is just pray, fall down fast, and we are useless to ourselves and to society. And based on the definition we have given them, there's, there's some element of truth in what they are saying. So when believers are being taught, when you bring the subject of holiness, righteousness, consecration, living a devoted life, pressing towards perfection in Christ, that must be a priority. But in addition to that, in addition to that, you must broaden the understanding of believers to see that they are in this earth and their lives must be useful and that there is a level of frustration they will experience even though they are in Christ if their lives do not make progress. Am I right on that? A day will come no matter how holy, how righteous, how loving Jesus you are. If you cannot pay the school fees of your children, if you cannot move to, you know, make strategic progress in your life, especially if you accent any position of leadership, you will find out that you are perpetually getting frustrated. And I can submit to you honestly that this is what is plaguing many believers now. 
they are unable to reconcile their passion, their consecration, that they have lived a life void of bribery, void of corruption, a life that is truly dedicated and consecrated unto God. The Bible says to seek first his kingdom and, and all other things, you see. And that scripture has not been explained properly. And unfortunately, there are many people right now whose it's like their passion for God is becoming a curse to their lives because they are not able to make progress in any other aspect of life. Their wives are asking them questions they cannot answer. Their children are asking them questions they cannot answer. Their companies and corporations are asking them questions they cannot answer. Their finances are asking them questions they cannot answer. And at the end of it, the danger of this kind of incomplete theology like we are experiencing now is that there is a generation of young people who are rising they are more audacious they have laws and policies that can defend their convictions they are asking all the generations before them i am not interested in this logic this your spiritual logic does not add up some of them will say i watched my missionary father love the lord and yet he was in debt till he died like the sons of the prophet i watched my father he would not take bribe yet we never had the opportunity to do this and that some of them would tell you i got into prostitution even though i'm a pastor's daughter simply because of this kind of frustrated life we had morning devotion every morning morning and night's devotion before we would sleep and i saw my father quarrel with my mother they never were able to live in peace you see it is very dangerous when the whole counsel of God is not communicated to God's people, I've been an advocate of meting out the whole counsel of God because as powerful as the various dimensions of God are, they become poisonous and even dangerous when believers only cherry pick one dimension and build their entire theology around it. For a while, it may not seem to be destructive, until God grants you grace to advance, then you begin to see the cancer that is producing. Hallelujah. So this is another addition. That in addition to your loving Jesus, living a consecrated life, following hard after him, loving him beyond things, you must have this at the back of your mind, that success, victory, and greatness is your heritage in Christ. Please look up. Being successful does not take you to hell. Living a victorious Christian life does not take you to hell. Are we together? Desiring greatness and attaining the same in your lifetime does not take you to hell. In fact, there is a dimension of God's glory you cannot capture and you cannot reveal if you are not successful, if you are not victorious, and if you are not great. You believe that? Say amen. You don't need to be an old man to see that when your life does not capture success, victory, and greatness, eventually your Christian experience will be lopsided, you will be frustrated, and all those who believe in you will eventually be frustrated. Let me tell you what is happening right now. Many of our younger people have believed some of these lopsided things, and there is a generation that is growing very angry very angry because some of them if they had an opportunity to hear the whole counsel of God um, look let me tell you the truth when you are taught God properly it doesn't make sense to reject him are we together now when you really understand God and you are taught God from the lens of balance accuracy you will love him with all your heart because then you will see his plan for your life the picture becomes whole. You will love him by, by choice above every other God and above every other practice. But something happens to you when the picture of God given to you is from the lens of fanatism or from an incomplete dimension. You will embrace it sincerely, usually as a young man. But as you grow, as you get married, as you get into leadership, as many responsibilities come, there are many people who are swallowing the software of imbalance, swallowing the software of lopsided, the, the pills like a tablet of lopsided spirituality. The reason is because the things that they have not learned, there is somebody in their life covering it for them. So they have not seen the consequence of not knowing those things. Eventually, 
Daddy goes to be with the Lord. Mommy goes to be with the Lord. The senior brother goes to be with the Lord. And they are exposed to a vicious reality of something they have ignored for years. Some of them get to learn that lesson when they get into family life. They carry their childishness and immaturity and find out that it's tearing their homes into pieces. And now, unlearning it becomes harder. It's like a man of 40 years going to nursery class with, with a short knicker and a vest. You know, I've made that example in this place. That while the teacher is teaching younger people, the man is sleeping. And the teacher says, number one, why are you learning this at this age? He says, well, no knowledge is a waste. But the man will barely learn anything there. Nobody, he can't play with anybody. Look at the kind of inconvenience he has to go through. This is what is happening to many people. For some of you, your Christian experience would have been richer and fuller had you known early enough that there are other dimensions you should not ignore. Some have been very fortunate. You were born again and immediately you did not have the... the, the you did not have the, the, the opportunity to rig my role around error and imbalance. You were brought immediately to experience the whole counsel of God. For such people, if they talk about serving God, they will sing that serving God is so sweet. And someone else is saying, which God? You've not, you've not come to see the God I'm serving, that's why. It's from the lens of your mentorship. Someone did not give you the complete picture of this God. And it's producing a kind of failure. I'm praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ that as we continue this discussion, God will open your eyes to see where you may have been missing it. I'm praying for everyone here. May your children never ask you questions you cannot answer. Are you receiving it? May your children never ask you questions you cannot answer. May your children not tell you, Daddy, Mommy, this God you have been serving, is it that this God is so wicked that he cannot even provide food for the home? Is it that he cannot even help us to have the convenience to serve him? Your life must change. Your life must change. You've touched his grace. Your life must change. You will never become successful. You will never become victorious. And you will never become great if you do not believe that it is in your destiny. Now the danger is that if all you pursue is success, all you pursue is victory, all you pursue is greatness as the end itself, you are already in trouble. Whoever swings to the other side of the pendulum and teaches you to ignore God, just pursue success, success principles, just pursue greatness, and you alienate God from your life, you know the danger? You will be successful. You will be great as much as the earth defines greatness. But because God is not a factor there and he's not your greatest priority, you would have brought to your life the things that will end up killing you. So after years of piecing together human laws that can bring success to you, you find out that you begin to die by the same tools you labor to bring to your life. I can tell you there is an element of success, victory, and greatness. There is an element of it that um, cannot bring you. It is only God being introduced in that equation that makes it valuable and profitable to you. Are we together? You get the balance now? But have it at the back of your mind. I studied my Bible. I made a determination to love God and to serve him all the days of my life. But when I found in scripture that success and victory and greatness is my heritage in Christ. I burned it into my spirit and into my consciousness. And there is no theology that will preach me otherwise. I believe that it is the will of God for me to live a victorious Christian life. I believe that it is the will of God for me, someone learning to live a successful life. I believe that it is the will of God for me to attain at the highest level of greatness that my life can command to the degree to which it will reveal Christ. This is what I believe. You believe that? Say amen. amen. Number two, a reminder that God is glorified when we are successful. Ah, I like this. 
God is glorified when we bear fruit. God is glorified. Psalm, Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3. It calls every believer the planting of the Lord. The planting of the Lord. That they might be called trees or oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Every believer is a planting of the Lord. Every believer. You have to believe this. If you are a believer, know that you are a planting of the Lord. That means God is a sower. Everybody say God is a sower. It's not just humans that are sowers. God is also a sower and his seeds are men. His seeds are men. Are we together? His soil represents the various regions of the earth. God is a sower. He sows men. He expects the men to grow like trees and to become fruitful. And the harvest that he gets is how he's glorified. Are we together now? He gets the harvest of the fruitfulness of the saints. It is not just in your destiny to be great. It is not just in your destiny to be successful. It's not just in your destiny to be victorious. You must also know that God is glorified when Joshua Selman is victorious. God is glorified when Koinonia is great. God is glorified. He is. Truly he is. Jesus caused the fig tree to show us and teach us a lesson that he is very, very unapologetic about fruitfulness. Matthew chapter, John chapter 15 and verse 8. The Bible says, Matthew 15 and verse 8. Herein is my father glorified. When ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So shall you be my disciples. When you bear much fruit, when you bear much fruit, he wants us to bear much fruit, to produce results. God is glorified. Do you know the meaning of that? Listen, any result you get in your life that does not glorify God is a useless result. Any lifting, any prosperity, are we together now? This is the difference between the world's way of seeking power, the world's way of seeking fame, increase, and so on and so forth. Listen, the reason why that happens to them that way is because there is nothing that drives them. Their world is governed by self. I remember years ago when they were teaching us evangelism, we used a little pamphlet called Four Spiritual Laws. How many of you ever saw that pamphlet, a green pamphlet? And you will see that there are all kinds of diagrams. The first one has the person sitting or the chair of his heart. Then later, the person is pushed away and the, the cross is there as a sign of Christ sitting there. Now, for the unbeliever, his whole world is about him. His pursuit for success, for him. His pursuit of greatness, for him. Usually, it is to prove a point. To prove to everyone who thought they were failures. But when you come into Christ, the angle with which you approach the subject of victory, success and greatness is very different. Everything becomes for his namesake. The reason why you want to prosper for his namesake. The reason why you want to do well for his namesake. Once that adjustment is made, your pursuit becomes godly. Your pursuit only becomes destructive. If God cannot get glory out of what you are doing. And I have taught you here with endless sermons, endless series. That your life, your pursuit for success, victory, greatness and anything at all that men desire. You must have it at the back of your mind. That everything I am seeking in this life is not just for my personal comfort. But that God be glorified. Shout it from your spirit through your voice. Say be glorified. Through my life. One more time. Say be glorified. Through my life. Meaning be glorified through my results. Be glorified as you lift me. Be glorified as you anoint me the more. Be glorified as Koinonia expands. Be glorified as I, can, as I take my children to better schools where they are taught great values. And help them to become great people. Be glorified. As I move from a tenant to a landlord. Be glorified. As I get to a point where I am so blessed. I am now a blessing. I sleep in peace. Not worrying about tea and bread. Be glorified. Someone say it again. Say be glorified. Be glorified. Through, my life, be glorified. 
through my life. Say it again, be glorified through my life. Every time I'm preparing for the miracle service, usually the theme of my prayer is this, Lord, visit your people. And then when I get to my own turn, I say, Lord, be glorified, be glorified again. Your servant is going to stand before your people coming with various situations, various conditions. It is not within my power as a man to help them, but my trust is in you. And when I begin to say be glorified, I just sense waves and waves of the anointing because God knows my heart is sincere before him. That everything I'm about doing as I stand upon this stage is to glorify him. The success that does not glorify God is useless success. The promotion that cannot glorify God is useless promotion. Now let me digress for a minute. And what does it mean for God to be glorified? I will tell you. God is only glorified to the degree to which Jesus is revealed through any growth, through any result. So that we are not vague in our discussion. Many people say be glorified, but there is no definition to what they are saying. I'm deconstructing that expression for you so that you are not left at a loss. Every time you are saying God be glorified, what you mean is through the result that come by engaging this through my growth let jesus be revealed i like it koinonia captures it so beautifully in fact in my opinion is the most beautiful expression of glory that i know jesus revealed jesus glorified jesus revealed so the bargain in the spirit is how is god's interest protected defended and advanced that is the bargain. It is the question you must answer if you want to do business with God. Lord, I'm trusting you to make me a billionaire. Fine and good. Here is the bargain again. How will the purposes of God be advanced through the millions? How will the purposes of God find expression? Let me tell you the truth. It is a bargain that if you cannot answer and you cannot step in to forget about doing business with God. Are we together? Lord, I'm trusting you to give me a great church. I'm trusting you to give me a global ministry. And God says, all things are yours. But here's the question. By the time I bring thousands and tens of thousands, by the time I multiply influence, I multiply bread, I multiply your voice, how will Jesus be revealed through it? Oh, many souls will come to Jesus. I will teach your word with integrity and truth. Now, the bargain for glorifying him is there. I'm reminded of what the Lord told me years ago that if you will let men see me there is nothing I will not give you meaning if you will live your life glorifying me there is nothing I will not give you be lifted high be lifted high oh Lord be lifted high for you are holy Righteous and worthy, oh Lord, believe. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, a big secret about this ministry by His mercy, the reason why we are on the frequency of ever increasing glory is because there is no room for the flesh to be glorified from opening prayer until we share the grace from sound of revival to every school of ministry every activity in this ministry is directly tailored at revealing jesus i will gladly decrease gladly gladly decrease and let jesus be glorified my greatest satisfaction is seeing people know him my greatest satisfaction is seeing people encounter him are we together that if you come and you are healed if you forget about joshua selman and you remember jesus it was an excellent bargain but if you remember joshua selman and even idolize joshua selman and then you forget about the one who died for you and you focus about the one who cannot even die for you you made a very bad bargain with destiny hallelujah I will tell you this in passing. The reason why many people do not see the hand of God in their lives is because although they are obeying the correct principles that lead to success, their hearts are very corrupt 
and they are just waiting for results to arrive and then the world will see another version of them and many times God withholds that result as an act of his love so that it does not tear you and add you to the memorial of those who have become a disappointment to the program of God if there is any way I know to move the heart of God is to hide behind the cross and say Lord be glorified in whatever you bring to my life if you add one dollar to my life let it be for your glory if you add one more drop of the anointing upon my head let it be for your glory Koinonia, are you learning this now we're discussing the roadmap I'm showing you why things don't work well for people. There are some of you, this is your sermon. As you came here tonight, God has been pounding it for years. Drop your pride and drop your appetite to be known, your appetite to be seen, your appetite to take the stage. If you can relinquish that, then you step into a realm that only few have gotten to. A realm where they are fearfully exalted by the finger of God. Because they have died to self. Are we together? God is glorified when we bear fruits. I am the planting of the Lord. It's a revelation that I have. God planted me in Abuja. God planted me in Nigeria. I only came through my family. I didn't come from my family. I passed through my family. Look at me. I know you call yourself Yoruba, you call yourself Igbo and Hausa. Geographically speaking, you are right. But spiritually speaking, you are wrong. You came from above through your family. Don't forget, your family was a channel, not the origin. That means whatever limitation you met there, you can conquer it by the consciousness of where you came from. That he that cometh from above is above all. So the limitations that trap Yoruba people, the limitations that trap Igbo people, the limitations that trap South Southerners, Middle Beltans, Northerners, Americans, Europeans, it may be true, but the consciousness of your origin, are we together? That since God will be glorified in my life, it doesn't matter what comes with my natural descent. I cancel it by the revelation of where I'm coming from. He that cometh from above, it's above all. Hallelujah. Is someone learning? Be glorified. I have seen how God is glorified in and through my life. I have seen how God is glorified in and through this ministry. My greatest desire for you, my dear people, is not that you watch a man who is glorifying God with his life, but that you become an active participant of birthing and bringing glory like an incense rising from your life, rising from your days. Every day you can tell God you've given me the gift of life. I want you to sit back and watch glory rise from me to you. Glory coming through evangelism. Glory coming by the correct use of your mind to better the lives of people. Glory coming by drawing people to Jesus. This is powerful. Glory coming by helping the poor and the needy. By next week, by the message of God. I'm so happy that the medical team, uh, you know, are doing the things that they are doing, helping people. Do you know it's something I am delighted in my heart. You have to be an unbeliever to be angry. That next week, somebody's life will be changed, diagnosis, all kinds of things, you know. You know, humorously, we discuss with our medical people that there are people who wait for Sunday to go to the hospital because they may not have the money to go to, you know, a hospital. So they wait patiently and they know that everything that happens at the medical stand is free. So they wait on Sunday. As soon as they arrive, they march straight to the medical stand. Diagnose me and treat me. This is the house of God. <laughs> And we're happy to do that. And we won't stop. No, we won't. We won't. It's a job out there, but it's a ministry here. It's a ministry. For as long as God grants us grace, we will continue to do everything with the strength that he has given to see him glorified. Someone again say, be glorified through my life 
For every one person who eats because your finances supported them, that is you revealing the glory of God. For every downcast person who your counsel gave them life and hope, just know that you are glorifying the Lord. Let me tell you this, one of the ways we grow in the spirit is by using what he's given. Don't desire more when you've not exhausted what he's given. The anointing he gave is for headache. Exhaust the headache first. There are many heads that are in pain. Focus on healing the heads. And before you know it, from headache, it moves to something else. Don't be praying for grace to heal cancer when he gave you the grace for headache and you ignored it because it's too small. I mean, what testimony I was once having headache and now it's gone. People say, my friend, go and look for something serious. No. No. Are we together? One way I know to grow in the anointing is effective use of the current grace God has given you. Use it faithfully and then you continue to grow. But the message here is that every one of us, please pay attention, God is glorified when I bear fruit. Listen, I have I've indoctrinated myself, not just that I'm a blessing, but that God is glorified through my life. When I come to church, I come happy smiling in my spirit why because god is going to get glory from my teaching god is going to get glory from my preaching as i'm preaching and the power of god rests upon someone i'm not just conscious of an anointed man showing his anointing no maybe someone's prayer request has just been answered the answer the age-long answer when i sit back and i hear the testimony sometimes i i, I, I just my heart i wish i could cry you see that now and I'm thinking the wonder working power of God. Look the testimonies that were shared. Cancer, whatever it is, just gone like that. How much can you buy those miracles? That is God being glorified for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, your life is the next to bring great glory to God. I say to a believer, your life is the next to bring great glory to God. You know how you know you are glorifying the Lord? There will be a witness on earth. Someone will say, thank you. Thank you, man of God. Thank you, this so, 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 and so. Thank you, my dear brother. Thank you, my dear sister. The advice you gave me last time has led me to love the Lord more. The counsel you gave me has taken me away from the way of wicked men. Now I'm pursuing purpose. I'm pursuing destiny. Are we together? The last time you took me to the prayer department meeting, now my prayer life has come back strong. And do you know, since the day I started praying, God started wiping the tears off my family. Curses and yokes started living. Now God is being glorified. Never leave your life for 24 hours without a direct imprint Jesus not being revealed from that life it is terrible Jesus you be lifted higher higher be lifted higher Jesus you be lifted higher Let our King be lifted up, oh, Now, I want you to sit down and pay very rapt attention, very rapt attention to what I want to discuss now. Number one, success, victory, and greatness is our heritage in Christ. Number two, that God is glorified when we bear fruits and we can program our lives, our success and our greatness such that it directly brings glory to God. Number three, success is not vague. Success, when we talk about success, walking in success, walking in victory in the kingdom, it is not vague. Please listen carefully. I have taught you in this house that success as we know is measured across six indices. I want to list those indices and then it leads us to the core of our discussion tonight. Success is not vague. Do not mystify success. You will never become successful that way. That success is measured across six areas. Number one, spirituality. The first area where we measure success for the believer 
is the extent of your spiritual vibrancy, the extent of your spiritual progress, the height that you have been able to attain in the spirit, as far as loving God, knowing God, and serving him is concerned. The first index for measuring biblical success is your spiritual health. Please write it down. Number two, very quickly, the second index for measuring success in the kingdom is your degree of transformation your degree of transformation total transformation but more importantly your mental transformation your degree of transformation are you writing and learning now so when we talk about success in the kingdom it is not vague at all there are six indices and none of them none of them is unimportant and the order of priority matters your spiritual health the greatest index for measuring success we're discussing the roadmap. I'm showing you a pathway that leads to ever increasing glory. Number two, your depth, your degree of transformation. The degree to which the word of God has designed a superior belief system. A belief system beyond your cultural context. A belief system beyond your sociological context. A belief system within the context of your nation, the frame of geography and all of that. You have been able to adopt a word compliant mentality, a mentality that wins. Number three, the third index for measuring success according to scripture is your health and physical well being. Don't assume that you've heard this, write it your health and your physical well being. You are not successful if your health and your physical well being is not added to the list because you need this body there's a reason why god put your spirit in a body and thanks to our medical people preparing for their outreach this is an attempt to help believers have wholesome success there are many people who are sick i'm telling you there are many people who are not all right we're not just talking of people malnourished we're talking of believers who have been careless over their health because they have not learned that being healthy and physically fit is part of spirituality and is God's definition of success. Number four, very quickly. The fourth index for measuring success is purpose. 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 Your assignment. Purpose. If you cannot answer the question why for your life, to your life, then you are not completely successful. Lo, I come. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7 in the volume of the book to do your will I come in the volume of the book as it is written of me not to do my will but to do your will to do your will Jesus walked upon the earth and he opened the scroll of Isaiah he saw where it was written concerning him the spirit of the Lord is upon me he had anointed me to preach glad tidings to the meek to bind up the brokenhearted set at liberty them that are bruised and so on and so forth and he said, this today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Paul himself, before King Agrippa, he was given a, 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 a manifesto of his assignment. Jeremiah in chapter 1, from verse 5 to 12, he was receiving a blueprint of his mandate that he was sanctified and ordained to be a prophet. By the time you get to verse 10, he is given the scope of his prophetic assignment that he has been set over nations, over kingdoms to pull down, you know, to destroy, to throw down, to plant, to build. The scope of his assignment. Your life is as useful as the definition you have of it. You were born to solve a problem. You were born to add to God's program. And if you do not discover your place in life and destiny, you will keep escorting others. You will be angry. You will be frustrated. You will pursue ambition and the fulfillment that only purpose and your divine assignment should give you. You will never have that satisfaction. I wonder what my life would have been if I did not find my place in destiny. I wonder how many people's destinies would have been closed because of one man's carelessness. And then those who found their purpose and allowed us to see through the lens of their discovery. We are grateful to them for today. I'm praying for you 
that because you find your place and walk in it, may someone also find his place through your own place in the name of Jesus Christ. That your refusal to discover purpose and destiny will not rob another person of living a useful life, of living a meaningful life in the name of Jesus. Purpose and your assignment. Number five, the fifth index for measuring success in the kingdom is your financial well-being. Your financial well-being. Being poor, broke, needy, helpless does not glorify God. Period. Settle it once and for all. God is not glorified in your begging, your borrowing, going to the hospital to be treated because of financial stress. It's not a demonic issue. Poverty is very, very dangerous. It affects the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Are we together? Make sure you hate poverty enough to walk with the word of God and do something about it. Financial well-being. It is true for an individual. It is true for an organization. Listen carefully. It is true for, you know, a corporation. I'm telling you sincerely. Do you know, while I was preparing my notes, I took time to meditate on the necessity of financial resources. And it honestly occurred to me that money is not everything. But over 80% of your needs depend on money. Hello? How many? Over 80%. Whatever accounts for your efficiency that far, it is foolish to ignore it. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In the name of Jesus Christ. You cannot live your life. Do you know there are people who beg and borrow for life? That's what they do. They beg and borrow. They wake up in the morning knowing today that if I don't beg, I will go hungry. They were like that. They married like that. Wife, keep begging while I beg too. Children, try your own friends too. Who Let's beg together. Now, I'm not being sarcastic. This is a very serious issue. I'm sorry to say, but there are pastors who live like that too. And it's not a good thing. They are sincere people. But you see, a life of begging and borrowing and poverty, it turns you, it misrepresents you. And you get to a point where your words don't carry weight again. Imagine that I got up this morning and I kept moving from house to house, disturbing everyone. I know you are a rich man. Since you won that election, you've not come to greet me. I prayed here in your presence. You saw me kneeling down every month on the, uh, uh, what do you call it, prayer request. And now you won your thing and just kept quiet like that. You've not even come to say God did it. And you know what it means by God did it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hmm. Resources can help you protect your integrity. Two, resources can help you protect your honor. By the time you, you keep disturbing those that God sent to you, you will lose your honor. The garment of the priest was supposed to be for beauty and for honor. For beauty and for honor. Hallelujah. You, you imagine that kind of thing. That because of the bills now, oh please come, there's an outreach here. How much are you going to bring? Please bring this. Please bring this one. Bring this one. You, you are rich. Don't. How much are you bringing? One million. You are joking. With all this prophecy I've been prophesying, I won't prophesy over your life again. How do I prophesy and you give me only, and then you gather everything, and then you come up and say, I don't beg. I will never beg. My God shall. And the person is just watching you and say, are you joking? We couldn't sleep yesterday night because of your disturbance. And here you are shouting on stage. And then you say, lift up your hands. The truth is they won't receive anything. They are not sure of that grace you carry. I will do your will, do your will, do your will, oh God. Lord, I will do your will, do your will, do your will, oh God. So, I just decided to press on it a bit. Just for you to know that if you reject the knowledge that leads to true wealth with dignity and integrity, 
over 80% of your problems will remain with you. You will go to heaven, no? but on earth here, you will be in hell. Are we together? Yeah. God warned me about finances. I'm glad I paid attention to him. I am grateful today by the message of God as a person and as a ministry. I am happy. I'm not ashamed of it. It doesn't matter who thinks what. Thank God for it. We can serve God today and shout his name to the nations because he has shown us mercy. And that mercy has come to stay. It's not going anywhere, I can tell you. It's not a one-week mercy. Mm -mm. Number six. The sixth and the final index for measuring success in the kingdom we're discussing the roadmap is the quality of relationships that you have and keep. The quality of relationships you have and keep. These are some of the things that money cannot do. These are some of the things. Remember I told you money does not do everything. Does many things. But there are things money cannot do. Money can buy a house. It may not give you a home. Money can buy several things, can buy a good bed, they say, but it may not give you sleep. There are many rich people who don't sleep. They swallow drugs like food and they still don't sleep. Are we together? Relationships. Relationships are powerful. They are harder currencies than even finances. So, spirituality, mental transformation, health and physical well-being, purpose and assignment, financial well-being and relationships now you write this down please the roadmap seeks to examine the principles you have been adhering to or neglecting on your path to becoming successful the roadmap seeks to examine the principles you have been adhering to or neglecting on your path to becoming successful. I'll take that again. The roadmap seeks to examine the principles you have been adhering to or neglecting on your path to becoming successful. The intent of this teaching tonight, having given you these foundations, is to bring you to a point where we will examine where have you been missing it. Now that you know that it is God's desire for you to be great, to be successful. Now that you know that God is glorified in your being successful. Now that I've listed for you that in contending for kingdom success, there are six areas. Never forget these areas. Five over six is not success. That means if you are successful financially at the expense of all other areas, you have failed from a kingdom standpoint. If you have relationships and you don't have God and you are not transformed, you are still a failure. Some of you, by this, by this explanation, you see right now that the only area where you seem to be successful is finances. Every other area you have failed. You have failed spiritually. Failed in terms of transformation. Failed in terms of assignment. Your body now as it stands is not even healthy. It's just that you have some money in your bank account, some business running, and then relationship zero. You are at risk. is zero by God's standard. Now the world will flatter you and clap and say you're a great man, chief. But I'm telling you, from the economy of the kingdom, you are not successful. Hallelujah. Now let's run through this list very quickly. And then we'll pray. Number one. What principles have you been engaging towards your spirituality? I want you to listen. If it is true that the first, the greatest, the highest index for measuring success is your spirituality. I want to probe into the principles you have been adhering to or ignoring. And I can show you. It's like an examination you are writing right now. And you are about to see your report card. That some of you have not been doing well as far as spirituality is concerned. Number one, I have taught you here that your spirituality is measured by your hunger and your passion for God. If at any point in your Christian experience, hunger is missing, 
your passion is missing something is wrong you are violating the principles that lead to true spiritual stamina hunger who is learning hunger that means you must always in becoming successful God's way you must examine is my hunger level still intact my hunger for God my hunger for the things of God my hunger for the house of God number two your prayer life these are the principles that makes an individual robust spiritually your prayer life your hunger may be there but have you translated it to prayerfulness yesterday we had an awesome time the prayer department had their retreat for two days and oh boy it was such a refreshing time even for me great time I think you should give them a great round of applause some of you the only way you pray is when trouble comes there's no other way the realm of the spirit can get you to pray once trouble comes you suddenly remember that I can pray and your prayer is usually a biased selfish self-centered prayer Lord if you do this for me I promise I'll give you money and the realm of the spirit is a nonsense because you think God is a politician you are in trouble here that is about to take your life and you are saying you'll give God money instead of you to say I'll give you my heart Are we together? Money? Oh God, turn my life around. Let me not die and I promise I will give you money. No. <laughs> that kind of bargain doesn't work in the realm of the spirit. Your heart. So your hunger level. Number two, your prayer life. The consistency of your prayer life. The consistency of your prayer life. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer. Say to prayer shout it say to prayer we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word so your hunger level the principles that lead to true spirituality your hunger your prayer life consistently praying all manner of prayers prayer in its entire variety and i've done several teachings on it you can get it to broaden your understanding about prayer number three your passion for the word the degree to which you are building your life on the word of God, damaging spiritual ignorance. You are not spiritual in ignorance. Spirituality and ignorance cannot go hand in glove. You are either carnally minded, remaining in ignorance, or by light, you have ascended to a point of spirituality. The truth is that many of us are saved, but we are not spiritual. And I've contrasted for you in this place that from a spiritual standpoint, there are three kinds of man. One, the natural man, unregenerate. Two, the carnal man, sensual, still a babe in spiritual things. Number three, a spiritual man who has attained unto stature by engaging these things I'm mentioning. Your hunger, your prayer life, your word life. Now, when I talk about your word life, look up please. It's beyond just Bible reading. Bible reading your passion for spiritual information that translates to knowledge understanding and wisdom many people read the bible but they are not growing they have finished the bible many times i have a teaching i, I thought i would be able to have to, to to teach us but um looks like we have to make that next year it's called evidence of grace there are indices that you must see in your life when the grace of God is at work. No excuses. If it is true that the grace of God is at work in you, it can appear unto all men and they should see certain things. There is visibility to grace. Are we together? Back to our discussion. Many people read the Bible, but they do not have spiritual intelligence. So when I talk about your passion for the word of God, it is mere, it is beyond opening Genesis and finishing it. That is profitable, but not enough. It is beyond opening the Gospels, you know, Epistles, Acts, and you say, Apostle, I read at least a verse or a chapter every day. That is wonderful, but that is the elementary level of growth. You must be able to acquire by passion spiritual understanding. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Let me show you what it means to immerse yourself in the ministry of the word. Colossians 1, 9. 
For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled, watch this now, with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And spiritual understanding. There is such a thing as spiritual understanding. There is a, an apportioned body of light that you may not easily learn on your own. You have to be taught spiritual intelligence don't tell me i am studying the bible translate that knowledge to spiritual intelligence let me see the degree to which you have understood the ways of god let me see the degree to which you can engage the principles of the kingdom many people are priding in finishing bibles here and there and that is wonderful but the scope of their understanding they are very narrow and limited you discuss with them and you know that these people do not know God nor his ways. My son, give me your heart, he says, and let your eyes incline or attend unto my ways. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is not necessarily maturity. Children do that in Sunday school. But they may not be matured. You can quote that before situations and they will say nonsense. There is no light. Light comes out of knowledge. Knowledge itself is not light. Light is a revelation that comes out of knowledge. Knowledge is the raw material wherein you draw revelation from. Are we together? Ephesians chapter 1. When you read from verse 17, the Bible talks about revelation in the knowledge. Revelation in the knowledge. Revelation in the knowledge. Revelation that resides within the knowledge. Like you get groundnut, peanut. So the, back, the shell is there with everything, but you crack it open and then you remove the actual groundnut inside. That's how it is. So knowledge comes, but you have to open it up and extract the light component out of it. That's why many people read Bible stories. They read parables, but they cannot get understanding there. I'm teaching you how to grow spiritually. Your hunger, your prayer life, your word study life, but then your passion to acquire useful revelation that translates to dominion. Are we together? Next, your passion for corporate fellowship. If your passion for corporate fellowship is missing, you cannot grow spiritually. There are things that God will not show you in the secret place. It is when you come to the house of God under a corporate anointing like this, there are dimensions of intelligence, impartations that you receive. Are we together? What is the next index for measuring spirituality? Service. 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 In all your becoming spiritual, you are not truly spiritual if you are not serving in the house of God and ultimately serving the purposes of God. So don't tell me I am spiritual. Don't tell me I am growing spiritually. I will ask you this. I will test your hunger. What is your hunger for God versus your hunger for money? versus your hunger for other things do you know you should be hungry and hunger is a general principle that drives you to pursue knowledge but no no issue in your life should have you hungry about it beyond god above god your hunger for god should be the highest level of hunger that should be and remain in your life are we together you must hunger after him more than you hunger to prosper you must hunger after him more than you hunger to advance. So, your hunger level, test it now. Your prayer life, test it now. Your word study life and your passion for spiritual knowledge that empowers you and translates to dominion. Are we together? Yeah. Your passion for the house of God. The moment corporate fellowship is something that your spirit disdains, it's an attack. Check it immediately. Finally, your service. I do not know how people live their lives not serving the purposes of God. Not necessarily in the house of God, but that your life must be about the king's business. Now listen, tonight is a checklist. You know that you are successful spiritually if all of these things are working in your life. And I'm asking you now, be brutally honest with yourself. Remember my preamble before we started? You cannot be transformed. You cannot grow 
if you are not brutally honest? Can you honestly tell yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 that you have a hunger level for God beyond 7? Less than 7 you are still playing. There is room to step up. In fact, you get to a certain realm in the spirit where if it is not at least 8 or 9, uh, there are certain things God cannot commit to you. Number two, your prayer life. Are we together? Some of us can wait for seven hours in the office of someone, maybe a politician, and you are not tired. The man will come out in your presence and say, ah, you are still here, sorry. Say, ah, no problem, chief. How about you again? I'm, I'm okay. You've not eaten from morning till night and you are waiting there. And you cannot spend 30 minutes in the presence of one who can touch the heart of anyone and redirect your life. You see how penny wise and pound foolish we are in the kingdom sometimes? Now I'm not saying there's to no, give honor to whom honor is due. But it, it would be stupid of me to spend 10-12 hours before men, mortal men, who were once babies in the hand of a woman, waiting for favor, waiting to sign something. Whereas in their hearts you can discern already that the answer is no. They are just playing around and wasting your time. Whereas I can go before the king. Ah, I cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. You're the king of kings and lord of lords. You are the king of kings. You are the lord. Your royal majesty. Listen, most of you do not know what God can do. That's why you respect men more than him. I honor men, no, but I don't worship men. Everybody was once a baby in the hand of a woman. Listen, koinonia, believers, let me advise you. This is the world of men. But don't forget that there is one who is the holder of every man's life. Any arrogant man can say tomorrow if he wakes up. If he what? Wakes up. I lay me down and I slept. I only waked for the Lord sustain me. There are many people in history who did not believe they would die. They themselves did not believe they would die. There are tombs today are testaments that all men are like vapor. But there is him that does not die. Come on. I rather foolishly waste my life and waste my time in his presence. It is more profitable to waste my time in his presence than to gallivant around the world of men that don't have the power. And then the person tells you, well, I was also expecting favor from somebody and I was hoping if they give me, then I will give you. No, let me go to the one who gives all things. I know you don't believe me. Yabone nakao Sujada ne na kawo Sarkin salama Sarkin aljana Yabo ne na kawo Sujada ne na kawo Sarkin salama anointing was stored in a library or in a bank some of us would not even have up to 10,000 worth of anointing now because of the wickedness in the hearts of men but thank God there is he that anoints men that we can cry before him and he can see the sincerity of our heart and whether you believe the man or not God decides and say I have found David my servant and with my holy oil I have anointed him I have blessed and it cannot be cursed. Cannot be cursed. Cannot be cursed. Listen. Listen. Koinonia, hear me. I'm showing you the roadmap to ever increasing glory. A man whose hunger remains, a man whose prayer life remains, 
a man whose passion for the word remains a man whose desire for corporate fellowship remains a man whose service to jesus remains is the man who you cannot do anything about till jesus comes i can tell you that there are some men that there's nothing you can do about the only way to attack them is to walk in partnership with satan to attack their hunger attack their prayer life attack their passion through pride an arrival mentality we dealt with that attack their passion for the house of god through offense and then attack their passion for service through exhaustion you have finished their spiritual life but for as long as a man's hunger remains i'm showing you how to weary satan in your life don't let men look at you and make it look like anybody can make you fall anybody can make you destroy you don't just fall like that there are things that must go wrong when your hunger falls when your prayer life falls when your word life falls when your passion for the house falls when your passion for service falls then your spiritual life will fall but provided this is solid i tell you you are you are as solid as mount zion mountains will come and go all things will come and go you will stand like the cedar in lebanon are we together we live in a world where spiritual people are so bullied with this issue of falling people just make it look like you can get up in the morning and just fall it's a lie rising is based on principles falling is based on principles there are some things that must be neglected consistently beyond the boundary of god's mercy for you to fall your hunger your prayer life your word study life your passion for knowledge your passion for the house of god your passion to serve god show me a man who works in keeping with this you have found the key for spiritual stability in an ever increasing glory i tell you storms will rise and come down you will still be standing standing anybody looking forward to your downfall will waste their time and their destiny for nothing are we together now Take your mind away from falling and destruction. Focus on your hunger. If something is wrong with your hunger, go for a retreat. If something is wrong with your prayer life, even now, go for a retreat. If something is wrong with your word study life and your overall appetite for spiritual knowledge, go for a retreat. If something is wrong through offense, you don't want to come to the house of God again. It's an attack. I don't care the reason and the legitimacy of it. If anything affects your service, you are in trouble. But if all these things are in place, let people prophesy. Let people say whatever. They will come and be old and go. You will still be standing. This is how God designed his system. Is someone learning now? You need to have strength and courage as you walk with God. God is not haphazard. There is stability to your walk with God. Take away the fear factor in your walk with God. You know how many people prophesied things about some of us when we started? You know how many prophetic words flew around and they will not stand? Nonsense. We are talking of the God of heaven. <laughs> Provided you keep the principles, there is nothing Satan can do. I pray for you. These areas I listed, if there is any one of them that is declining in your life, from the depth of my heart, I pray for you now. Because the area declining is the area Satan is attacking. May fresh fire be restored to your life. <laughs> Sit down. The roadmap. Number two. I hope we are able to make progress. Let's see where we can stop. Who is learning? Number two. What is the secret to transformation? Number one, the secret to transformation. I'm showing you the roadmap so that you will know it and you can guide others. I've shown you how to be spiritual. It's not vague. There is an exact pattern to spirituality. What is the key to transformation? Listen carefully. The ultimate key to transformation is your awareness your recognition of your current condition mentally the knowledge that a lot happens in your life as reflected by your mindset or otherwise 
that if your destiny will happen, you have a mental contribution to your success or a mental contribution to your failure. I have taught you here that your mindset and your belief system is your contribution to your success or your contribution to your failure. If you fail in life, it's not entirely the devil. If you succeed in life, it is all God in truth. But in terms of its dynamics, you participated in many ways among them through your transformation. How do we contend for transformation? Number one, an awareness and a recognition of our current level in terms of our belief system. You must get to a point where you are honestly aware that the reason why my life is like this the reason why my influence is diminished or not even there to start with. The reason why I don't seem to have been able to make constructive progress is because something about my thinking is faulty. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So number one, you recognize. Number two, you go for strategic knowledge. Strategic knowledge. And let me tell you this, strategic knowledge is most enhanced through structured mentorship. Strategic knowledge that leads to your transformation is most enhanced through mentorship. Mentorship allows you to hear the knowledge, the body of knowledge that is relevant. The, the, the beauty of mentorship is that sense has been edited from nonsense and you can trust what you are hearing. Are we together now? There are certain products that if you get from the farm directly, it's profitable, but you can't consume them immediately. It's not been refined. It's not been worked on. You can go to the mall and you find the same product, but maybe it's been deshelled. You know, it's been prepared and all of that. You pick it and immediately you can consume it. That's what mentorship does. Mentorship goes to the farm of destiny, brings a harvest, cleans it, purifies everything, puts the seed together, creates a buffet, then calls you to come. You learn without the pain factor. Listen carefully. So I am trusting God for transformation, knowing that my mind has a lot to play with my, as far as my destiny is concerned, or my overall success. I recognize honestly without being ashamed that where I am today is a product of my mentality. My next assignment is to go for structured knowledge, not any and every kind of knowledge. Knowledge that drives away darkness in the area of concern. And that is where mentorship comes. Mentorship helps you. It distills knowledge. It serves you with knowledge that has been tested in the life of the individual and gleaning from those who have commanded results, consistent results. When you get knowledge, what is the third thing to do? You meditate, you meditate, you meditate. There cannot be transformation without meditation. The hearing and hearing again, the hearing and hearing again. I have taught you in this house that there are two levels of hearing. There is hearing that brings awareness and there is hearing that brings conviction. You need both. You can have the hearing that brings awareness and not grow. But the hearing that brings conviction, that thought is now embedded in your subconscious. It's gotten to a realm where it must act out its physical reality. It is true. And the key is repetition. Faith comes by hearing. There are materials as I've listened to without exaggeration for thousands of times. Hundreds of hours put together one material. The purpose was not knowledge. The purpose was to transport it into my spirit and when it resides within there no wonder the psalmist said i have hidden your word in my heart you literally can carry your heart as a soil and bury something within program yourself to victory are we together now transformation look at me many of you here are still victims of culture. You are still victims of the pain of yesterday. You are still victim of the mindset of yesteryears. Even though you are in Christ, God cannot trust you with greatness and victory. The reason being that your mind is not yet transformed. You cannot become a leader thinking like yesterday. You will punish the people God brings to you. Are we together? I have taught you that there are many of you because of the mentality you have, you are easily angry. It's not that you are an angry person. There is a mindset, a software that is cancerous, eating up your mind. 
if you are not healed from it, God cannot bring people to you. You will hurt and wound the people. I have told you it is only those who are healed that can heal others. Wounded people wound other people. When you become a father with a poisonous mindset, a mother with a poisonous mindset, a principal, a, a principal, a director with a poisonous mindset, a pastor with a poisonous mindset. It is the reason why all leaders, as a matter of urgency, must contend for transformation that exalts you beyond the negative grip of culture beyond the negative grip of your past, the negative grip of failure, the negative grip of your small-minded association, you rise to a point where you think like the eagles, where you think like lions, where you think like a winner, you think like a champion. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who is understanding this? So when you see that you are not transformed, by the way, how do you know you are not transformed? The quality of your decisions. The kind of results and testimonies that recycle around your life are a report card as to your mindset. A report card as to your belief system. Let me tell you this. Every level of possibility in the spirit and in life requires a certain kind of mindset. Oh, I want to be a millionaire. There is a mindset. If you don't have, you cannot prosper God's way. I want to be a man of God over thousands of people leading them. There is a mindset, not just a heart desire, a mindset. I want to be Esther. Esther is a mindset, not just a woman. Are we together now? Ruth, Deborah is a mindset. Paul is a mindset. Gideon is a mindset. Abraham is a mindset. You must have the mindset. I taught you here that the mindset to rise up and walk is what produces the miracle of rising up to walk. You will never have the miracle of rising up to walk till you first have the mindset of rising up to walk. What do I see in my mind? A glorious koinonia. What do I see in my mind? An ever-growing, ever-increasing ministry with vibrant people serving the purposes of God. What do I see in my mind? That the arsenals of darkness, the gates of hell, the conspiracies of men and demonic assaults cannot stand. What do I see? Victory. What do I see? Greatness. What do I see? Success. What do I see? Our children rising to become greater than us. This is what I see. He said, what seest thou? I see the rod of an almond tree. He said, thou hast seen correctly for I will hasten my word that you have seen to perform it there are things I will never see I refuse to see failure it's a choice I refuse to see weakness I refuse to see defeat are we together now yes don't bring yesterday's photo to me I don't want to see it I look forward only are we together now? Yesterday had its chance when it was my today and tomorrow. Now that is my yesterday is gone for good. God did not give me eyes at the back. I will not create one. I look forward and I go forward. Is someone learning now? Mindset. If someone looks at me now and says, Apostle, you are stupid. I will even pray about it. Because I have transited myself. Do stupid people serve God like this? No. Are we together now? Yes. So you have a mindset. There are battles you don't need to fight. Transformation takes you out of the ring so that you are not there waiting for needless battles. It's children that fight those kinds of battles. Listen, Koinonia, if you learn this, you will be at peace. There are many sicknesses that are mindset dependent. The reason why the sickness can plague you is because there is a thinking that partners with that disease. Are we together? Number three, what is the secret to health and physical well-being? I'm not a doctor. Come next week, Friday and Saturday, and you hear a structured explanation as to how to be healthy. But I can tell you a few things. Number one, gluttony kills. Hello? Gluttony kills. Number two, if you don't eat well, you will die. I can tell you that one. If you don't eat well, you will do what? And I have scriptures. 
Genesis 42, 1 and 2. Jacob met his sons and said, why do we sit and look at one another here? I hear that there is corn in Egypt. Verse 2. Get you theta and buy for us that we may live and not die. So when people don't eat and when they don't eat well, they die. Everything taking bread from your table, I curse it this night in the name of Jesus. <laughs> While I'm telling you that gluttony is bad, if you do not have sufficient food, you are malnourished, you will die. I can tell you that. Are we together? Number three, inactivity. Medical science will tell us inactivity for an indefinite period deadens your organs till you die. Medicine, medical people, you should buy me a gift after buy me a gift after koinonia because I'm doing part of your next week work now. Inactivity. That means laziness is death calling your name. Laziness is not a sign that you are a big man. Now let me tell you how it happens in Africa. As God starts prospering us, we start dying because we stop doing many things, including thinking. In Africa, if you are a big man, it's a taboo to drive yourself. It's a taboo to trek out. It's a taboo to buy anything. It's sometimes it's even a taboo to eat yourself. And we think these things are a sign that you have suffered. This is your time to enjoy. And before you know it, sicknesses that have no business finding you, they find a lazy, inactive person by a, a negative culture-driven software. Wrong definition of prosperity. There are people who were healthier when they were poor. Their real problem started when God blessed them. Are we together? And, and this is something that all of us must repent from. Your house, AC. Your car, AC. Everything, AC. You never take fresh air for the rest of your life till you die. You call it enjoyment. Sitting before a big screen morning till night. Hurting your eyes, hurting the various parts of your body. One leg up, one leg down from morning till night. You have all kinds of servants. Uh, John, go and get me water. Ruth, get me this. And I'm not being sarcastic. I am telling you, it's, a, it's an African cancer. Sometimes because we have suffered too much, you want to draw me to destiny that I've arrived. It's unnecessary. Are we together now? You must make up your mind that this body, you are hosting my spirit for a long time. Who is in agreement with me you are hosting my body for a long time if i wake up every part of my body must wake up i won't wake up and my hand now refuses to rise up mm -mm. hand wake up there's work to be done i won't wake up and then my eyes will not wake up no speak to your body i'm telling you as a principle i learned that from kenneth copeland speaks to his organs and say in the name of jesus you are functioning healthy nobody will call me one day and say one part of my heart has collapsed let the devil go to hell in the name of jesus christ he keep at his bones keep at his bones now please don't feel bad if you are sick we're here to pray for you i know that there are people but i'm challenging you this is how to be successful health wise and then there are many things you need to painfully take out of your life Huh? I don't want to kill anybody's business, but let me tell you the truth. I've taught you that there is death in the pot. Some of you have been eating death many times in a day. Make sure you verify, am I eating life or death? You know how we do it in Africa? Two wraps of swallow with soup all around. Are we together? And literally one quarter or half of chicken, only you. And then two bottles of minerals no water no water you drank water when you were poor now you're a rich man no water are we together and then you eat everything and while you are doing it you are listening to my message mm, it's right apostle is preaching powerfully Plus one minus one is what? Help me, plus one minus one. That's the reason why fasting is good. Aside from the spiritual benefit, fasting helps you. 
there are times you just shut down and give your body peace for a while let it work on the things you are already damaging those things let clean out those things i'm telling you if you're under medical advice don't fast as the doctors recommend but i'm telling you once you are alive and healthy if you eat every day and every time you will still die if you don't eat you will still you see how you everything must be in moderation as for me i plan to live long and among my many strategies is to eat well as god begins to help you please live yesterday and start eating well there are some of you to buy clean water you say no i will spend this kind of money god forbid you see that something about yesterday still wants to drag you you will not mind fetching water directly from the well with cup and drink. i said this is not the kill you know all those kind of things i hope you are not just laughing when people are dying in your presence every day, say, I will be healthy. Be say it again, I'll be healthy. I'll be healthy. Wives, ladies, learn how to cook healthy food. Learn how to cook healthy food. Don't kill your family because they married you into the house. Learn how, I'm giving you an honest advice. Don't be offended, I'm sorry, this is koinonia, but learn how to cook healthy food. Are we together? Learn how to cook learn how to cook healthy food and i'm praying for you in the name of jesus christ if there is anybody here that the devil has already put a death sentence that before the end of the year maybe because of carelessness some of you were smoking before some of you were drinking before you've damaged your liver damaged your organs i pray for you by the power that raised christ from the dead may the mercy of god bring a resurrection to your organs May the mercy of God bring a resurrection to your organs. May the mercy of God bring a resurrection to your organs. May the mercy of God bring a resurrection to your organs. In the name of Jesus. Number four, your purpose and assignment. I won't speak quick, so much there. There are only three keys I will give you here. Discovery, refining, and deploying. That is the key to working in purpose. I refer you to the book, Discovering Your Potentials by Dr. Miles Monroe. Then I refer you to my teachings also on purpose. I've done a number of teachings on purpose. But here's what I will tell you. You are as fulfilled to the degree to which you discover, refine, and serve with excellence. Make sure you pray that you'll be taken as part of the School of Ministry students. By the way, soon we'll give the announcement for the next session. And make sure that you start praying right now. Prayer works. <laughs> Hallelujah. So that you are absorbed. And there you have an opportunity to learn, learn very strategically the matters of purpose and destiny. But the key here, a rule of thumb, is that you have to discover it's been there you don't invent your purpose you discover it you were sent with it and there are many ways to discover it number one the use of your potentials when you discover your potentials potentials are pointers to your purpose i would always say it this way if you see an individual holding a stethoscope what do you call that individual a doctor when you see an individual holding a knife and i mean um, um, a hammer and a nail that person is called a Thank you. You see that now? So you can use your potentials as pointers to your purpose. Number two, prophetic revelations and confirmations. God comes to you in dreams, visions, prophetic confirmations. Number three, a byproduct of service. Sometimes service in the house of God is how you really discover what he's put within your heart. Right? So this is just a summary. When you discover your potentials, even if you don't know where you are taking it to, the next thing is to contend to refine it to refine it oh god has given me the ability to speak you refine it god has given me the ability to sing you refine it god has given me the ability i have very high intellectual acumen refine it and then when you refine it begin to serve look up please the easiest way to begin to serve your purpose is the house of god as a worker are we together now philip started as a welfare person but he eventually became an evangelist. The Bible acknowledges him as an evangelist, but he started with welfare. From there, he discovered his place. You can start as an usher 
and eventually end as a mighty apostle because as an usher your gift will now be seen and one day they will say lead a small prayer here and they begin to discern the hand of God upon your life gradually you begin to scale proving through faithfulness that God can take you higher and higher until one day he will now commit to you your own work that's how it works let's go to number four very quickly who is learning tonight the roadmap I won't talk much about finances number four or number five now am I right number five is your finances I wish I had time to drum it I hope I will take one of I promise you it's a promise I'm giving you between now and when koinonia is done we'll talk about this money thing one more time maybe one of this week will come and just touch it again are we together because this finance thing is not something you hear once and understand it's a very stubborn subject you need to hear and hear again and file this area file that area file that area finances the, the teaching of finances comes with a lot of pride because most times people hear it and say you mean it's this simple until they try it then they find out that they were trying to hold water with their hands everything just went out there is a skill to it to make it work are we together but generally I will tell you this you prosper to the degree to which you are valuable you prosper to the degree to which you are favored you can rest on that you prosper to the degree to which you are valuable and you prosper to the degree to which you are favored the two principal keys that control wealth and abundance is value and favor through relationships take this as a rule of thumb value turning your gifts your ability to products and services packaging it with excellence and serving it to a targeted consumer base you call that business we call that value are you seeing that now the degree to which you are valuable serving solutions that are needed and useful the reason why certain professions look more profitable than others is because they solve greater weightier problems than others are we together if a doctor and a carpenter an architect is here most likely the doctor will have more clients because humans are prone to being sick faster they need health solutions better than even a housing solution are we together now so when it has to do with prospering there is a spiritual side to it and listen to all of my messages that I've preached around finances but I must tell you this if you are not valuable and you do not refine your value and serve it with excellence I hate to be a bearer of bad news you will be poor or you will not be sustainably wealthy there's a lot of superstition around wealth especially as proposed by the church and it's the reason why a lot of non-christians are laughing and mocking and spiting the church because it looks like our entire theology about wealth is centered on giving and giving alone while giving plays a very major spiritual and even psychological role to wealth it is not limited to giving alone principally value there are spiritual laws that connect you but I've taught you here value the degree to which you are able to serve products and services that are needed and useful are we together this mic was bought this pupit was bought or fabricated this Bible was bought this phone was bought are we together the dress that I'm wearing somebody put this together whoever was part of this value chain has had a portion of our finances it doesn't matter whether the person was a Christian or not are we together now that's how it works immediately after service you are going to a restaurant or you are going to cook at home the one you bought food from you paid the one you are going to whose restaurant you are going to are we together now that person will continue receiving your money provided they are providing value and then the second angle to it is favor through relationships question when a millionaire gives birth to a son what business solution did the boy solve to prosper it's called inheritance it's not called profit it's called inheritance are we together now eventually his inheritance can be transferred to profit but at the time it is called inheritance so relationships are very powerful anybody you sell value to can reward you but the person that likes you too can bless you it's not called reward but it's still money reaching you and that's the most important thing now when God really wants to power your life he grants you access to do both 
that you are both valuable and he connects you to strategic profitable pro destiny relationships it doesn't keep you lazy but it becomes an acceleration for you there are many people who relationships can give them capital and wisdom can help them do business with the money and they begin to scale if you ask them how were you blessed they will tell you both relationships and value don't depend on relationships alone it is the way of a lazy man even if relationships give you resources it is wisdom and learning how to transact that grows your resources but if the only thing you know is how to transact value, your, your growth rate will be very slow. Are we together now? Because transaction from an economic standpoint is tampered by many nuances, many biases. Relationships are a great leverage in life. Don't ignore them. I am a product of the financial blessings that have come from relationships largely relationships are powerful are we together now you can build a house you can own an estate you can have a, a property whatever it is but by the time you transact there are people who have written books it has blessed them there are people who have sold their materials their intellectual property it has blessed them some of you here make clothes my assignment is to release grace on what you are doing if there is nothing you are doing releasing financial grace on it is profitless are we together lazy people shout amen with empty hands visionary people carry their value up and receive blessings on it when people are lazy they just shout amen for what what are you going to do now say nothing all i know is that somebody will not sleep We need to be careful. Are we together now? There are others who truly believe that they won't do anything in this life just because they love Jesus. Somebody must give them his house, his car, his clothes, pay their children's school fees while they just sit down and say God is faithful. It's the way of fools. I'm sorry to say it, but it's the way of fools. Even as a man of God, I don't expect that kind of result. That you are immune by priesthood. But I still believe that my hands are blessed. My mind is blessed. That favor will come, but I will not abuse the grace of God. Is someone learning now? In the name of Jesus, the spirit of laziness around your life, I curse it right now. Amen. Hear me? If you are troubleshooting your financial problems, the first area to go to is whether or not, whether or not you are valuable. Are you valuable then to who? If you are only valuable to yourself, you are flattering yourself because you cannot pay yourself. You will have to serve that value to another outside of yourself. And if the person does not need the value you carry, then unfortunately there will not be a reward. Some of you are valuable enough to be commended, not to be rewarded. Are we together? We can clap for you for the value you carry, but it's not exceptional enough, it's not refined enough, it's not packaged enough. Value must be translated to productivity. Productivity is when value is translated to goods and services that are now refined, served with excellence to a targeted consumer base. Then you are rewarded, not just commended. And then favor through relationships. I have taught you sincerely so that the easiest way to prosper is through relationships. Who hates you does not matter. I will say this to you endlessly. But who likes you matters. May someone like you before December. Yeah. Enough to contribute to your financial laughter. Yeah. Are we together now? I expect blessings from favor every day, including finances. I'm saying it without shame. I'm saying it without any sense of apology. Are we together? But then, after you check the issue of value, check the issue of relationships. Now, let me tell you this. I'm not teaching you to be parasitic in your relationship or to say you, you are poor, you can't be my friend. Apostle, I've thought that prosperity comes from relationship. I found out that I've, I have too many poor people around me. That's, mm, don't do that. Because the person you are laughing at today, God can exalt the person. But I will tell you one truth. I will tell you one truth. I will tell you one truth. When you are transformed, your relationships will also rise to match your transformation. If everybody around you is poor, I'm telling you sincerely, I'm not insulting them, but it's a report card to how your thinking is. 
you can steal the contact of a rich man from somebody's phone call the person and see whether he will pick your number the fact that he's not picking your number means he does not recognize you you have not gotten to that realm so rather than embarrassing yourself contend by light to a level where those who you call great today will also call you great is someone learning now yes I didn't even know when the contact in my phone changed quite honestly it was not something that was intentionally done and I can't remember deleting the old ones but I can't find them that somebody you desire will be the one to collect your phone and say let me type my number to be sure you are there you see everybody blesses according to his riches in glory if somebody is poor he cannot bless you you get what i'm saying he may pray for you he may intercede for you he may wait upon the lord for you but as far as financial blessing is concerned you will not get anything let me tell you sincerely don't waste your time it is wealthy people that can help give you the leverage of wealth it is the truth it is the truth pray for everybody to be around your life but in this season pray for quality people established by the mercy of God that they will look upon you with kindness and extend benevolence to you whilst God helps you to solve their problem too these are very uncomfortable truths especially because you are saying it in church but the truth is still the truth a poor man can pray for you but a poor man cannot help you financially are we together If everybody around my life is poor, I will just believe I'm sent to them. And I'll start praying for my real helpers to come around. Hallelujah. Do you believe what you're hearing? But then I will tell you this. And even if this is where we stop tonight, that is still fine. There is a grace that prospers. There is an anointing that prospers I've proven it with my life it is true if it's something someone told me you can say ah you are just talking nonsense but the things we have seen the things we have heard by the mercies of God the things that our hands have handled are we together now honestly speaking believers hear me there is a grace from heaven that comes on the head of a man and redefines your financial possibility and for someone tonight, whilst you are seated quietly in the name of Jesus, like the dew of Hammon, in addition to the value you are providing, in addition to the strategic relationships, you are at a point in your life now where you need help that men cannot give. It will take the God of heaven showing you mercy. Otherwise, you will wake up early in the morning. You will sleep late in the night. You will rigmarole the doors of destiny, even the doors of value, and it will still not work for you. I pray for you now, wherever you are, provided you came here with hunger. This grace that can help men, that becomes a, a, an accelerator to your your financial journey may that grace rest upon your life may that grace rest upon your life may you become a financial wonder in addition to your value in addition to relationships may that grace rest upon you oh, oh, oh rest on me oh, oh, oh. Rest on me. Oh, 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 oh. Hallelujah. The goal of the teaching tonight is to connect desires with outcomes. It's like a spiritual troubleshooting. Are we together now? I'm running for you a list so that you will go back. As you are listening, this is what mentorship is about. You can now examine what area of your life that is not working. I wish we had time for me to touch a bit on relationships, but we have to pray now. But relationships are very vital. Some of you are alone. You are lonely. Nobody to help you. You know many people, but you did not connect to them. Listen, the one who helps you is the one you connect to, not the one you know. You can know the person, but if you are not connected, help will not flow from them to you. Are we together now? I know this senator. 
You may not be lying, but you will never receive help from them. I know this man of God, knowing people does not benefit you relationally. You must learn how to connect. Connect. And the way you connect, let me tell you this. Live tonight knowing that relationships are investments. The same way you do real estate, you do oil and gas. My brothers, my sisters, relationships are investments. It is fraud to want a return over any investment you did not do. Are we together? When you are catching 419ers, catch those who want a return from investments, they did, relationships they did not invest to because it's fraud. It's amazing how many people do not invest in lives. They just show up and want a stake. No, it doesn't work that way. If you were not there when I'm crying, when you see me smiling, rejoice from afar. Don't come near me. Are we together now? You can earn a living believing in people. You can earn a living believing in people. That I take the risk to believe in you. If you fail, I have nothing to lose. But if you succeed, I will become part of the foot soldiers that believed in you until you're rising. There are people today, whether they do business or not, the truth is that they have done the business of risking their credibility to believe in those rising. And fortunate for them, it worked. It worked. Are we together? It worked too. Some of you don't believe in anybody. You run away from people while you are checking with the side of your eye. Once you see a crown on their head, you run and come and say, remember I was here. They say, no sir, that is fraud. Show me the sign of blood from my tears. Show me the nails, the sign of nails. Did you help me carry the cross? Let me tell you this. Make up your mind that you will start believing in people. As you come for koinonia, you may see others, no car, no nothing, but they are shouting amen every day. You see them rising. Don't laugh at them. Oh. The day fire falls on their head, in one month they will come and testify and say, I got a job, somebody did whatever. And you tell them, sir, that man that helped you, do you know he's the one I've been trying to give a contract to? And you say, I don't know you. I don't know you. Joshua Selman, I know. Are we together? And let me say this with all due respect, even for men of God, don't appear in the life of a successful man and just call him your son. What did you do in his life? Don't show up in the life of people and just claim a stake. They are not idiots. They may respect you, but they are not stupid. They know where the anointing came from. That's why a lot of people say, can you imagine I did this and nobody came back to me? It's a lie. It's impossible to invest in building people and selflessly and God leaves them and they forget you. Don't go around stealing sheep and claiming you invested in people. As men of God, is it not funny how we are? We don't call any sick person son. We don't call any, any person who is having a mental problem son. We only pick, cherry pick successful people and say you are my son, you are my daughter. How don't you believe in the person who is sick until he's, he's transformed to become a sign and a wonder? And he can say, I remember when I came, I was weak. I was in debt like the man of David. Look, you have transformed me to a mighty warrior. We become your foot soldiers. You will never be hungry, not when we are standing. Let me tell you the truth and I submit to you. There are people, even preachers, who have spent their lives investing in lifting people. Today that those people are lifted, no matter what you say, those people will die defending the ones who were there for them. Relationships are investments. Don't waste it. Some of you see our little children and push them away. You are pushing your house. You are pushing breakthrough. You are pushing a, a position for your children. Mutual respect is the way of the wise. Are we together? I'm showing you a roadmap today. I have learned this from people and God has placed wonderful senior mentors and people in my life. And one of the advice they gave me, I've seen it in their lives, that they spend their lives investing in quality relationship. You will never mention any ministry in Nigeria that they don't have someone there. Someone they raised, someone they blessed, someone they fed when he did not have food. Now he's a governor. Now he's working somewhere and he can come and say, I'm still your boy. Oh. They call me excellent 
excellency, but I'm still your boy. What do you want me to do? Please give this person a job. Consider it done. To you is a sign and a wonder. To them is a destiny they programmed. Listen. Leave Koinonia tonight with this consciousness. Start programming your 2025. Don't allow it to come and meet you alone. Don't allow your heaven to be brass and your earth iron because you ignore people. As pastors, respect people. Don't look down on them just because they are listening to you. God is working on them. God is lifting them. If you are a rich man today, respect those who are coming because you don't know you have reached your plateau, but the people who are rising, you don't know how far they will go. Are we together now? If there is anything I've learned is that relationships are investments. If people really matter to you, then invest in their lives. If you don't invest in their lives, don't claim they matter to you. And stay away from their success when God leaves them because you have no stake there. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. There are people today, I don't expect them to take me so serious because I cannot remember making any kind of direct strategic investment in their lives. I didn't make any investment in that kind of relationship. It would be stupid of me to expect certain levels of returns. Whatever I get, I'm grateful because that spells the kind of investment I made. But there are relationships that were intentional. They are still intentional. God brought somebody to learn. All your destiny helpers are around you. They are not yet destiny helpers, but they will be destiny helpers tomorrow. Don't ignore them. That house boy in your house, don't ignore them. That lady washing your plate, don't ignore them. They may not have money now, but they are listening to the word every day. God is lifting them every day. That neighbor, pay attention to people. Scatter your seeds. Give a portion to seven, yea to eight. You do not know the disaster that shall come upon the earth. Are we together now? You see somebody, good afternoon, sir. Oh, you are an architect. Oh, God bless you. Something falls on the ground. Let me pick it for you, sir. You may think it does not matter. One day he will look at you among the crowd and say, you are looking for a job. I remember you. What did you study? You will say, I'm even ashamed to say it. Say it doesn't matter. You were the one who were kind to me in Koinonia. Come, you have the job now. I can tell you testimonies of people. And I say that with all humility. And I thank all of you here who have given people jobs because they belong to this family in addition to their competence. On their behalf, I'm saying God bless you. But there have been people, they didn't have to do any interview. The moment they mentioned Koinonia, I said that's it. Provided the value you can, pro you can do all of that, come on board may your name be a key not a padlock yeah. I say it to you as I ask you to stand now may your name be a key and not a padlock yeah. that if your name has locked the door of destiny over your children locked the door of destiny over everyone that the, when people want to succeed they have to deny you to succeed they can't tell people they know you because the moment they mention your name a door that was open becomes closed I pray for you whatever has made your name a padlock may mercy scatter that padlock now in the name of Jesus the roadmap next time you see God lift people and, and you see people succeed in the kingdom don't say it was a mistake these are the kingdom principles among others for tonight I did a troubleshooting for you across these various areas of your life go back and listen to this message again point out where you have not been practicing it or where you have not found light add more material to it and pray in the spirit and watch your life rise as for me this journey I've begun with the Holy Ghost. This journey I've begun with a de in destiny. It is from glory to glory. From glory to glory. This I'm, I'm speaking to myself now. It is from glory to glory. Never having a better yesterday. In the name of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth in one minute and begin to give God praise for what you have heard tonight. A thought prov provoking examination of your true state Take time to pray. The roadmap. The roadmap to excellent spirituality. The roadmap to transformation. The roadmap to health and vitality. The roadmap to purpose, destiny. 
the roadmap to financial vitality the roadmap to strategic pro destiny relationships Bible says narrow is the way straight is the way narrow is the way very few people go there and yet it leads to life broad is the way that leads to destruction go ahead and pray thank God for what you have heard and pray for grace tonight I obtain grace I obtain grace I obtain grace someone pray I obtain grace to be vibrant spiritually to contend for transformation to be healthy and physically vibrant to walk in purpose to walk in my destiny I obtain grace to excel financially I obtain grace to invest in strategic relationships in Jesus mighty name we pray maximizing your destiny a call to fulfill God's purpose beloved Today we gather as young adults who are not only full of potential but also anointed and appointed for a divine purpose. The world is filled with distractions, challenges, and uncertainties, but the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119, 105. Our focus today is on maximizing the destiny that God has entrusted to each of us. We are going to explore how we can live out our purpose and fulfill our divine calling. Number 1. Understanding Destiny in God's Kingdom Before we can maximize our destiny, we must first understand what it means in the context of God's kingdom. Destiny is not just about personal success or achieving worldly goals. It's about aligning our lives with God's will and purpose. Jeremiah 29 11 reminds us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This scripture highlights that our destiny is God-ordained. It's not something we create, but something we discover as we walk closely with Him. Number 2. Embracing Your Identity in Christ To maximize your destiny, you must embrace your identity in Christ. The world will try to define you by your past, your failures, or even by the standards of success it upholds. But in Christ, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 your identity is not based on what you do, but on who you are in Christ. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This means that God has already prepared a path for you to walk in, one that is filled with purpose and meaning. Number 3. Seeking God's Will Through Prayer and the Word Maximizing your destiny requires a deep and consistent relationship with God. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 advises us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Prayer is the vehicle through which we communicate with God, and the Bible is the roadmap for our journey. When you spend time in prayer and in the Word, you align your heart with God's will and gain the wisdom needed to make decisions that are in line with your divine purpose. Number 4. Overcoming Obstacles with Faith and Perseverance Every destiny comes with its challenges, but with faith and perseverance, you can overcome them. James 1 2, 4 encourages us, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The obstacles you face are not meant to break you but to build you. They are tools in God's hands to mold your character and strengthen your resolve. Number 5. Surrounding Yourself with Godly Counsel one of the keys to maximizing your destiny is to surround yourself with people who will encourage, challenge, and support you in your walk with Christ. Proverbs 13.20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. The company you keep can either propel you toward your destiny or pull you away from it. Seek out mentors, friends, and leaders who will speak life into you and guide you according to the Word of God. Number 6. 
serving others as an expression of God's love. Our destiny is never solely about ourselves. It's about impacting others for the kingdom of God. Jesus himself said in Matthew 20, 28, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One of the greatest ways to maximize your destiny is to serve others. When you use your gifts, talents, and resources to bless others, you reflect the love of Christ and fulfill the purpose for which you were created. Number 7. Staying focused on the eternal perspective. As young adults, it's easy to get caught up in the pursuit of temporal success, career achievements, financial stability, or personal accomplishments. However, maximizing your destiny means keeping your eyes on eternity. Colossians 3 verse 2 instructs us, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. When you live with an eternal perspective, you make decisions that have lasting value. You invest in relationships, character, and the advancement of God's kingdom rather than in things that will eventually fade away. Number 8. Walking in Obedience and Faithfulness Finally, to maximize your destiny, you must walk in obedience and faithfulness to God's calling. Luke 16 verse 10 says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. God looks at our faithfulness in the small things before He entrusts us with greater responsibilities. Obedience is not always easy, but it is necessary. When God calls you to step out in faith, do so knowing that He will equip you for the task and reward your obedience. Conclusion Beloved, the time to maximize your destiny is now. God has placed you in this generation for a reason. You are here to make a difference, to shine His light in a world that desperately needs it. Don't settle for anything less than God's best for your life. Remember that your destiny is not about achieving worldly success, but about fulfilling God's purpose for your life. As you leave today, let the words of Paul in Philippians 3 verse 13 to 14 resonate in your heart. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Press on, beloved. Maximize your destiny and let your life be a testament to the power and glory of God. Amen. Please don't hesitate to like and share our contents. You can follow us on all of our social media platforms at Believers Global TV. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.